about two years ago. Right, so here we go. I'm not going to be talking about the schoolroom today. I don't like it to mention, you never know, but it's a general overview of the history of weather. History and heritage, two maybe slightly different words. Heritage is things that we've inherited, if you like, from the past, whereas history is just in the past. So slightly different, but uh, oh, right. So where do we begin? We begin with the Doomsday Book. Now, if you notice there, this is from the uh, Philemon's translation of the Doomsday Book. It starts at the top in Creelage, and then there's the translation in Wellow. Totally wrong. Wellow wasn't even invented, if you like, or discovered at this time. Whoever did that translation mistook uh, Wellow for being Creelage. Uh, so unfortunately, that uh, has misled a lot of people. Now, uh, there was a village called Crately. And we believe it was probably, this cream which was probably Crately, uh, which was about a mile away from here. And we'll come into the story of that in a minute anyway. So, there's a little bit of misleading information to start with because it tells us that you know, two and a half caricatures of land taxable and land for four plows and so on and so forth. Twenty-two villages and two small holders. But it's not Wellow at all. Because Wellow wasn't even in existence at that point. So I'm not going to bore you with exact dates and everything. I'm just going to give you approximate dates here. But, what happens then? So, Doomsday Book 1086. About eight odd years later, we just, I said, just using the dates here, we find that Rufford Abbey was founded. And at the time of the foundation of Rufford Abbey, there was a lot of movement of uh, parish boundaries, because the parish of Rufford was created at this time. And prior to that, if you look at the top here, this is how the parish of Wellow is today. But Wellow wasn't even there, but Grimston was, which is about Two-thirds of a mile east of here, where it's a deserted medieval village, so it's no longer there, it's been gone for several hundred years. Uh, so that was further down the road, uh, just there, there we go, so about, I'll say, two-thirds of a mile, something of that nature. So when Rufford was founded, now we all know Rufford anyway, so we don't need to go into that, so this is where Rufford Abbey was, just here. And look at the size of the parish, that they were given in comparison to what became the parish of Weller. Now there was three locations mentioned where village people, villages lived. One was Rufford Village, somewhere around here. One was Crater, which we think is the one that was in the Doomsday Book. And the other one, Wurchenfeld, but we're not too sure how many people lived there. It might have just been a little tiny hamlet. So, Rufford was created. The people from Crately, Rufford, and anybody from Wurtchfield, and anybody else anywhere within there, basically were turfed out. However, land was found for them just up here in the parish of what would have been the parish of Grimston at the time, not the parish of Wellow. But this piece of land was founded, and there they was able to re-establish themselves. So the people that was uh, turfed out of their homes and anywhere in the Rufford area for the construction of Rufford was sent along to there. We're not saying they all went there, we don't know the answer to that, but a good portion went here and established the village of Well. So that's the mid 1100s, mid to late 1100s when this was being created. And now this is what's known as a planted village. Most villages now, you imagine what we call ancient parishes. There was um, 238 of them in Nottinghamshire, each one having probably one village and a hundred or two with them. Uh, there's no exact science to that. But uh, there's only two villages in all of Nottinghamshire that was what's known as planted villages. All the others just slowly evolved into what they are today. The other one is called Colston. Uh, so this is just a rarity in itself, and that it was a planted village. Now, as 
if you like, a little atonement for it, and then being turned out to their homes. All the people that settled in this new village of Wello were allowed to be free men. So they were all free in their own rights. So that was a little bit of thank you for them. And that situation existed, but we know for several hundred years thereafter, we have a document dated 1553 or 4, I can't remember exactly which now, and that does list all the freemen and well, pretty much all the village. You know, they were freemen, even those hundreds of years later. So the parish boundaries were altered, and uh, as I say, the parish of Rufford was created. Um, this would have probably been known as Grimston with Wellow or Wellow with Grimston, whichever at the time. It would have been. Uh, one of those double names because there was two thriving villages at the same time when Weller was created. Now we've got another little issue coming along here. As most of you know, that there's this rather unusual dye, which we'll talk more about later, that surrounds the village. So you can see where the parish boundaries are just here. So it surrounds the village just here. The big question is, which we still don't know the answer to, was the diet there before the village, or did the villagers create the diet? And that may quite well, since they can make a big difference as to the purpose of the diet, but there's still debates going off on, on this even today, um, what the purpose of the diet was. Now, if the village was, sorry, yeah, if the village was put inside the diet, and the dike was there before the village, then it wouldn't have been used for any form of defensive purposes because there was nobody living in it. But it was probably just used as a compound for animals, whether it's cattle, sheep, whatever it might have been. However, if the dike was constructed by the village folk themselves, it leaves it wide open. They still could have had it as a compound, to not only keep them, uh, to live inside, but to keep their own cattle inside so it didn't go astray. But it could have also been used for defensive purposes as well. Many debates still going off by historians and archaeologists on this all throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. We still don't know. We're hoping in a couple of years' time to have some organ work done where you know, drill a hole down into the ground and start looking at soil samples across sections and um, to try and determine when it was constructed. It's still not guaranteed, but that's what we're hoping to do in a couple of years. Right. Moving along then. Grimston. So here we go. So here is the time map from the 1840s of uh, Wellow. And the village is down on the left hand side. Now Grimston was up here. So just on the main road, and that's a photograph there, of, that's Grimston Hill as it's known today. Uh, so it was just here in this area. Now what the situation that we've got, moving on to the next one, about half a mile north of Grimston Village is the site this is what we call the ring works left over from a modern Bailey castle known as Jordan Castle. From what we know, it was a modern Bailey castle, probably a, a typical wooden structure. Uh, and then at a later date, we do believe that there was a stone structure put there. And we do know that in the mid 1200s, uh, Jordan Foliot, uh, he applied to have it crenellated, you know, little castellations around the top. And for defensive purposes, and that was granted. So then, the big question is, did it look like that? I don't think so. I can't quite imagine that. It probably looked more something like that, I should imagine. Uh, we really don't know uh, what it looked like. You know, obviously there's no sketches and no photographs, uh, because, but notice that again, an unusual situation here. Jordan Castle, named after Jordan Foley, a Christian name. Not somebody's surname, or not the name of the village, or the hamlet, or the town, or whatever, but it was named after a Christian name. There were three Jordan Foliots, who were the lords of the manor. Uh, exactly which one it was named after, I don't know. But uh, 
Nevertheless, there we go. But, about 1330, the Foley family had no more male heirs, and one of the daughters had married into the Hastings family of Arundel Castle. Now, that meant the Hastings basically became the lords of the manor, but they were absentee landlords. They would have been down at Arundel. They're not going to leave Arundel Castle and come and live in something like this, are they? You know, so, there we go. So, we believe at that particular point, Jordan Castle, as it's loosely referred to, would have fallen into disrepair. The land still would have been uh, farmed by all means, and there might well have been a tenant farmer there, but, but we do know that it did fall into disrepair, and uh, the, the manor passed into other hands later on, and uh, the manor house basically moved down into the village, which is where the hall, which we'll come on to later. So we've got that uh, interesting little feature. They're still there in the village. That photograph is only about three years old. So it's only recently taken that. And I was up there filming uh, with an archaeologist, but creating some films for the school children. So you'll get a copy of those. <laughs> uh, we created three short uh, archaeological videos to introduce archaeology to the local school children. And it was so interesting because the cows are all there now. Uh, so we went up there filming, and when we stood in the middle there, and the farmer's there as well with us, of course, Mr. Carr, and uh, uh, looking at, and all the cows stood around in a semicircle, just all watching us, <laughs> watching what we were doing, building out there. Uh, so most interesting. But, of course, we're coming along then, we you know, panned out on that map now, and there was Jordan, uh, sorry, Gibson here, Jordan Castle was just up, off up here, and Willow Wings. So Grimston disappears, what were they on as a deserted medieval village. Um, we do believe that it became fully deserted by the end of the 1500s. So that's quite some time ago now, isn't it? But yeah, there's still uh, the old names there, Grimston Hill, and uh, I'm sure Johnny you tell us more names up there, won't you? Grimston, uh, in Grimston Green is the one as well. Or Grimson Field. Grimson Field. Grimson Field, yeah. So some of the names still exist up there. Right. Wellow Hall then. We do know that Wellow Hall has its original construction in the Tudor times, and it's believed that there's still some Tudor elements left inside the hall, which if you don't know where it is, it's only whatever, 80 odd yards down that direction. Still standing there's a fine building even today. And uh, it was originally uh, the Bollinger family and then the Fulgian families that lived there as major landowners. As we know, as time evolved throughout England, lots of land which was all once held by the Lord of the Manor. But it was slightly different because there was a lot of the land was freehold anyway. But the Fulgians and the Molyneux, um, they did become quite decent sized uh, landowners in, in this point. But we're not saying that that was ever actually a manor house. It was just a large house where the main uh, landholders lived. Because of later on, the Savills of Gumbert became the lords of the manor. And the Fulgians and the Molyneux were still living there. So they were not the lords of the manor that was living there. Nevertheless, there's a full description of it uh, given from the, in the 1930s uh, from the Land Revenue Survey. And it had 11 bedrooms in there. And that's quite a substantial property. However, there's not much of the Tudor property left. There was major additions and refurbishments in 1700 and then quite a few more thereafter. So we don't have too much time to go into every little bit, uh, but there's lots of interesting letters. Mostly written by the females of the families, uh, specifically during the 1700s, uh, related to them and their relations, going backwards and forwards, describing life in weather. Quite fascinating, actually. Uh, they're out of the uh, Nottingham Archive of these letters. I've not gone into them in detail, I've just uh, sort of scanned out some of those there ones. But it uh, gets a lot of interesting information there. Right, another interesting little feature then about Wellow is the amount of common land that there is still surviving today. It's said that there's more common land 
uh, in any other village in Nottinghamshire. Uh, there's more in Southall, so the little you prefer, but that's classed as a town now. But as a village, when I say it is said, it is true, because I've been on the internet and the county council do have a register on the internet of how much common lands in each village. So apart from uh, Southall, this is the largest of the villages, more common land than anyone else in the county. And uh, so all these areas in green, the verges and they get quite large and the green here and, and all this area around the dam is all common land and so is this particular lake you see the castle there as it goes up here to Cocky and Moor that's all common land it doesn't mean saying anybody can do anything that they want on it you want to have common right uh, uh, authority if you like which comes with whatever property you own and uh, so forth but uh, nevertheless it is common land there and I suppose any of these people that have got the rights can still go raising their cattle on or their geese or whatever they want to. Uh, but I think it's a little bit too open these days and um, we might get run over by the traffic, I think. Right. Farms. Now, if you have a look at this, probably like many old villages, the area was split up into lots of different farms. So there was the first nine of those farms were all at their locations based inside of the parish of Wellow. Most of them, uh, I think seven out of the nine, in the actual village centre itself. Again, nothing unusual. It's only after enclosure when people started moving their farmhouses out of the village. So during, well, in fact, these farms have pretty much stayed in the village. You know, we can say there's one, there's one, there's one, just as we stand out the front door there. And the, the farmhouses are still there. The bottom three then, so Rufford Lane Farm is in Rufford Parish, and Wellow Farm is in Rufford Parish as well. Um, although only just, and it was scraping, but they I did have fields with inside the parish of Wellow. And then there were cottage farms as well. So, yeah, it was just a typical village in that respect, agricultural base. Just looking at uh, what we're looking at here, three working farms remain, Jordan Castle, Hall Farm and Woodside, which is previously part farm, as you can see. So, they're the three that are remaining, and you can see that there are quite a variety of um, different products, but these are the cattle. Uh, that are up in the uh, Jordan Castle field up there. <laughs> uh, very lovely actually, I've never seen the rest, but uh, the farmer did warn us not to go in the field without him because he might not like it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we've just got the potato picking down at the bottom here, so uh, interesting little pictures for you. But these are some of the farmhouses. So each one of these were constructed in the Georgian period. I find this one quite fascinating. It's you know, structured quite differently to the others, although they're all Georgian. This is one of the working farms just here. I call it Hall. Hall Farm and Moat Farm work together basically nowadays and they're next door to each other. So that one is Moat Farm and Hall Farm is just at the side of it. Right. I'm just looking at the time because it's the first time I've given this talk and I'm not quite sure how to pace it. So mm -hmm. we need to finish by about quarter to or ten to the latest, so we can have a little break for those that's going on the walk, and then we're going to take a guided walk around the village for those that search on in this. Right. Wellow Park. No, there you go. <laughs> now I've just been up there this morning and uh, it, it is a beautiful place. And uh, you can see those are little uh, Crowns on that. <laughs> uh, on the walk as well. Now then, <clears throat> so the park itself, that was created, we don't know exactly then, but somewhere around the year 1200 ish, plus or minus 20, 30 years. And it was created as a deer park. And uh, this on several occasions when the monarchs actually stayed at Jordan Castle. So it wasn't a totally little, tiny little wooden put by any means because the actual king stayed there on several occasions and on some of those occasions the king is recorded in the, what we call the close rolls um, where as a thank you for their hospitality to the foliate family it, the king gave them deer to stock their park up 
and, uh, and the deer was taken from the Royal uh, Deer Park in Sherwood to be given to Wellham Park. So we, we know that uh, for definite that there was a deer park there. Now it is said again that uh, that's a, what they call an ash witch elm tree. That's right, if I, if I remember right, isn't it? Yeah, ash witch elm trees. It's got, supposed to be the largest uh, group of them within Nottinghamshire anyway, in that part. Uh, in part there. However, uh, what else I was going to tell you about? When the Savills were the lords of the manor, they converted, well not convert, well, I suppose it was a conversion, but it was no longer a deer park, let's put it that way. They turned it into a leisure park. And in the 1730s, they created, have I got it on here? Yeah, there we go. They uh, created a crisscrossing pattern of what they call rides. Uh, so the uh, gentry could go up there with their horses. And the one coming down here goes straight down to Rufford Abbey. Oh, it did do in those days. So it points straight down to Rufford, down there. Uh, so they could go along anywhere around there and it said that the ladies with their parasols would be parading around as well and uh, well, they passed the gentlemen on their horses uh, imagine the way of life however it was criticised because the uh, trees were set too close together in other words the rides were not wide enough that the sun couldn't get in to rejuvenate the grass so it's ended up just being mud tracks up there. And if you look at the one at Rufford Abbey, of course, it's very wide, the sun gets in, and it's beautiful grass there. But these, they didn't make them wide enough. So that pattern you can still see today. Go to Google, your satellite, and you can still see that pattern today in the, in the woods there. Right, look at that, five pubs as well. Look at it. Right, so um, the Black Horse, that's right. So the Black Horse is a, oh, it was a building just to the side of what is now the Well Avenue. Mm -hmm. So it's just literally next door. So that's just there. And so what else have we got? Right, the door box itself. As you can see, that is quite a new building next door. Uh, so that's what it used to look like, just there. And of course, that is just literally next door to us. And that one was called Live and Let Live. Mm -hmm. And that one uh, has been demolished. That was on the next door to the Red Lion. And if that was still standing there, you wouldn't have to get in the car park because they were right next door, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, so there's the Red Lion. Those two pictures are dated about 1907, 1910-ish. But there you go. So there's the Red Lion, there's the Live and Let Live. <laughs> Not a big deal at that time because we were both owned by the same family. But still, <laughs> uh, and finally, the White Horse, which is across the road, which is a holiday like today. So, the only one that's uh, actually been demolished, well, that's been demolished, of course, but being replaced, but the living that live is no longer there. So, yes, there were the five pubs there at one time. But it wasn't such a big deal because all of these, I mean, you just look at the Red Lion and the living that live. Uh, they, they were just small properties. Mm. And at the time in the heyday, of, we're going to talk about population in a minute, but in the heyday, there was coming on 600 people who were here. And you imagine, you might only get 20, 30 people in one of these at a time, so let's say 30. So five times 30, 250 out of the 600 population. It doesn't sound so badly, does it? You know, when that was probably their only form of activity, during uh, leisure activity during the Victorian times. Right, what we're looking at here then is Wellow was like many a town, they did have various yards, you know, little um, enclaves, if you like, of uh, dwellings uh, where people lived. So here we are in the schoolroom. This is all now the car parking for the Maypole next door, and then this would have been the Durham box. And here was the yard, it was known as Frisbee's Yard for most people's memory. And there was other yards uh, around in the village as well, two or three other yards around. Here was a saddler's shop, 
and there was a blacksmith down on this side as well. So you don't think of a little country village like this of having these sort of town yards in it, do you? But uh, nevertheless, uh, it did have several of the yards. This was the biggest of the yards that it had in the village. Now we're going to have a look at the dike. Sorry, we're not. I forgot mm -hmm. about this, that picture there. Oh, yes, I forgot about that picture because you can see there's a schoolroom. And then you can see the front of these buildings. That one just there is just there. That, that would have been the saddler's shop. And then, of course, the archway here that uh, goes through uh, into the back, under here, into the back of the Durham Oaks. Ah, population. There you go. Just to, we're not going to go into that in detail, but just to give you an idea. So when we were talking about the five foot, like I say, in the heyday, there was only 600 people living here. Uh, probably taken from the census return, but just look, by the end of the century, only 281. Less than half the population in 50 years. Starting to climb back up again. But uh, 1911, 249. So population went down quite a bit at that particular time. Right. What do we come on to next? The Maypole. We all know one of those famous bits of Maypole, don't we? Now, there's variations in numbers given around here, but they're supposed to be, uh, the traditional Maypole is supposed to stand at least 60 foot tall. And they're supposed to be, uh, uh, on a permanent basis, uh, the best guess is about 70 of them left in the country which, out of 16,000 ancient parishes, uh, most ancient parishes, that's the, that means pre-1538, so out of 16,000 ancient parishes, there's only about 70 that's got a permanent maypole left. <coughs> However, what makes it even more unusual is that how many out of that 70 actually have annual, forgetting COVID, uh, but actually have annual Maypole Day where they actually practice the rhythm dancing around the Maypole. It's believed to only be about seven of them left in the country. Uh, so uh, seven out of about seven. Okay, the figures vary, and they're different figures. So that's, that's not a be on end all figure, but it's quite a rarity here in Wellow. So well, let's have a little look, look at some of the pictures. So there's a picture from the 1950s. And this one, I'm not sure. What would you think? That's the 1970s, what do you think? Something like that, isn't it? Well, there we go. But this one, I've been told, is from the 1920s or 30s. And you go, there's your main queen in the middle there. So a lovely tradition. We know, we've got records taking us back to about 1834 of uh, the tradition going on on an annual basis. So it's a lovely tradition to uh, keep us going here. Now then, the dike itself. It's interesting to see how it has survived. Very unusual <coughs> shape. Part of it is uh, a development from natural watercourses. Other parts of it, which you can see particularly where it's straight here and here, would have been man-made. But other parts of it is from natural watercourses that have uh, been running along here. So it is a bit of a mixture of each. We still don't know the origins of it. I say some people think, oh, this part of it is high enough, uh, you know, steep enough to be defensive. Um, you know, even this one, you know, is a substantial. Believe it or not, from there to there is 2.4 metres height-wise. So, there's still lots of thoughts about it. And as you can see how deep it is, uh, that photograph was taken from somebody standing on the top and uh, obviously somebody standing in the bottom there when we were doing a survey of the dike. And this is quite a good cross-section, just off of Billet Lane, which is just a few yards up here. Uh, very good cross-section here showing you the depth of the dike. 
But those of you coming with me on the walk, we'll get to actually walk around parts of it and uh, see for ourselves. Be interested to find the origins of it if we ever can get there. So, what are the interesting things that we've got? The schoolroom itself, where we're sat in. There we go. So, I love the old pictures, but look at that, even from the inside of the schoolroom. We've got members of it. Uh, you know, we've got two or three people that's uh, given us their members of actually coming to school here. Uh, one gentleman lives just across the road, he shared his memories and, uh, at the times that they spent here. We'll not tell you all of his memories at the moment, but uh, uh, we've got some of the memories recorded down uh, on the boards at the back there as well. I wanted to often record about the schoolroom. But 1854 it was established. Before 1854, we know that there was a school in a cottage across the road, Sunnyside, where it just happens the same gentleman lives today. But there was a small school held there prior to this one being established. But if you remember the population figures, in the 1850s, that was the height of the population in this village. There was a great need for a school at that particular time. So it existed as a school from 1854 until the 1890s when the Oddington School was, a uh, new school was built bigger and better and the children were transferred there. But in 1924, if I remember right, is it? Uh, no, sorry, 26. In 1926, this had to be opened up again because the Oddington School was now not big enough. So this was reopened for the youngsters from the village here. And that was from 1926 to 1940. So this was once again used as a school. So in between time, it's been used as a community hall, basically. Right. Uh, back to Willow Hall. Now the interesting thing there, Willow had its own cottage hospital, for those of you that didn't know. And there, uh, we have uh, the surgeon, I'm just trying to think that we call him Doctor or Mister. <laughs> but uh, we call him Mister Ward anyway. Uh, Mister Squire Ward. Squire was his name, not title. Uh, so he was the surgeon, and one of his sons actually uh, learned to become a surgeon as well. But after after Mister Ward Senior passed away, uh, it wasn't long after that the hospital sort of collapsed. So we're talking 1840s to 1880s, but. The most interesting thing is, of course, that Mr. Ward, he performed the very first um, amputation of a leg whilst a patient was under hypnosis. And the patient said that he did not feel a thing. Um, there's a big write up about it in the medical journals, and, which you can find on the internet, and all the full description. That some of the surgeons uh, down in London were very skeptical about it all. But, uh, anyway. uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's all recorded there, and it happened. And um, just the James Womble was my second cousin five times removed. <laughs> so, my, my, I, although I don't live in Wellow, my ancestors did. And uh, the Wombles of Wellow. So they're not really <laughs> That's another little interesting thing for you. Right, the church. These are lovely pictures uh, um, by Grimm, the 1780s. Uh, Reverend Richard Kay, who was, um, he was the Reverend down at Kirby and Ashfield, but he was a baronet, you know, one of these very uh, well to do uh, clergymen. And he employed um, Samuel, was it Samuel, the Rogerus Grimm, uh, for two years, I think it was, and he sketched all over Nottinghamshire and Nottinghamshire. And it created all these fascinating sketches for us. So that's what Wellow Church would have looked like around 1780. Uh, just as a matter of interest, we know that the church is one of those things that you could go on forever and a day talking all in its own right, but it does date back to the 12th century. So you can imagine it was being founded at the same time that people were thrown out of Rufford, building their own homes. As soon as they built their own homes, they would have start work on the church. Whether it was just a wooden structure to start with, you know, it was a temporary thing, whilst they got themselves settled, 
who knows? We don't really know. But certainly the stone architecture, some of it does date back to the late 12th century. And it does have the Norman font in there, uh, within, still there today. There's six bells it's got in the tower, which is quite some substantial amount of bells, really, for uh, uh, such a small parish church. Six bells there. Now, there is an interesting story that uh, a lady in Waldron, she was visiting the Waldron family at the hall there, and she got lost one day whilst out walking in Weller Woods. And she didn't go out, and the woods are over 200 acres in size, so it's a fair size wood. So she was out there walking and she didn't know way back at all. There's some, the story has it that the church bells started ringing, and she was able to follow the sound of the bells to wake herself uh, way back home again. And it says here, she, she, just quoting here, uh, she showed her gratitude by donating £14 to the church. It's interest to be paid to the church bell ringer who was to ring the bells on the anniversary of the same day, which was the 19th of September, that she got lost and was found. And um, those bells are still rung today. Um, in fact, that's what we did it's next week, isn't it? And uh, they had Jean Cross, she's the one that goes and rings the bells on that anniversary. And uh, so she'll be ringing those bells. So there's obviously some truth to the story, you know, it's still followed on down the uh, times there. And then, in the churchyard, there are some interesting uh, tombstones there. Both these two sets of tombstones are both listed. Uh, I, I find this one in particular is fascinating. It dates back to the 1600s, and you can still see all the engravings, despite the fact it stood up. You know, it hasn't been weathered that badly. You can still actually make it all out. Right, uh, where are we going to do this? I'm just conscientious of the time there. Methodism. Again, two Methodist chapels in a small village. Yeah, there was about 600 on population, but two Methodist chapels. The 1851 census of religions shows us that the primitive Methodist chapel, 120 people here at its main service, another 70 odd here at, it, at its Sunday school, and then the Wesleyan Methodist, uh, which became disused in 1927 when the two churches merged. That's again just. Uh, just up Billet Lane, which is just a few yards that direction. And uh, the building is still standing. And again, you can see uh, the amount of people, maybe you can't, <laughs> but uh, what is it? It's about 80 odd people in attendance there. 80 there. I don't think they can count there because uh, the two numbers don't quite match up there. But so, whatever. Let's say 250 odd people attending Methodist churches out of a small village. That's a substantial amount of people. The chair making industry. Now this is one of the things that we uh, comes as a bit of a surprise on a small country village where there was a substantial chair making industry employing upwards of 40 odd people out of the village manufacturing chairs. Now these two chairs are genuine chairs that were made here in the village. But by 1900, the industry had completely disappeared in the village. But early censuses were shown, I'll say, it was a 40 odd people working in there. I put this picture up here at the red line because the main centre of the chair making industry was in these row of buildings behind the red line. So they were originally workshops that were then, after the chair making industry had finished, were converted into cottages. And after cottages, they were taken over by the Red Lion, as it is today. So yeah, quite an interesting industry here in the village. Pinfold. So we've got a lovely little pinfold there. We know that the pinfold's been around the village, probably around that same sort of area, since at least the 1500s and possibly earlier. Although that one doesn't date that. That one only dates back to 1842. That the, that a 1553 document that I mentioned earlier does talk about uh, the pinfold in that particular document. Whether it's on exactly the same footings, we're not sure. But certainly pinfold close was in the set next to it. Two Tudor cottages still surviving in the village. 
one right next door just here. Uh, so that's Rock House. And uh, so we can see the uh, cantilever structure here sticking out over the pavement, which is still there today. And this is sunny side over the far side. And this is the one that was used as a school prior to this paint being constructed. And later on, after it being used as a school, it was also used as a small shop as well in that front room there. I did actually come across a photograph uh, last year which actually showed the shop frontage of it in the 18, sorry, 1950s, uh, after which it would have been uh, disposed of that shop front. We also have a dovecoat. And, uh, Lodge farm, wasn't it, that we went to? Yeah. Yep. On the lodge farm. farm. Yep. Uh, so, uh, as we know that in the years gone by, people did eat pigeons and doves for their meals. It said that there would be upwards of 200 nesting boxes in there. And, uh, see our little friend coming across here now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can still see on the end here, uh, you've got the sun in ledges where they would uh, sit and the little holes there to go inside, which is still there today. So you can see the little coat there. Right, the wells um, on Potter Lane, we've still got the surviving wellhead. Uh, still over its original well, we believe. And I went onto one of the old audience survey maps and I've highlighted all the wells. And there's 40 wells here that I've highlighted around the village. So, substantial amount of wells actually, that is for a village. And I've been told that there are other wells out on the outlying farms as well, like Jordan Castle Farm and Park Farm. But I've just got one last little thing to mention, and that is the uh, plane crash that took place during the Second World War in uh, Wellington Bomber. It was, took place on the 9th of August 1943, up near the village of Grimston. Uh, so, again, on the Newark Road, about half a mile or so out of the village, uh, where the uh, plane it had uh, taken off from Ossington, uh, but soon developed engine problems. They tried to turn it around, the crew did, to get back, but uh, to cut a long story short, I'm afraid they were not successful, and the plane did crash in the fields, and unfortunately none of the crew survived. But uh, there was the police sergeant, Ernest Flinders, was well known for his uh, bravery at that particular time. But there was also Jack Langsdale, was there not? Uh, there as well. So the two men, uh, they were out in the fields there and they rushed off up to uh, the field to see what they could do. And Ernest Flinders, he did drag seven, three, three of the bodies out of the plane and he couldn't go back in anymore. But you got to bear in mind that this was quite an area in a great thing to do. Also, unfortunately, he wasn't able to save anybody because not only was it on fire, but the ammunition was also exploding all around him as well. It does been explained to me that the ammunition exploding would have been just like a firework that had been cut open. but it wouldn't have been shooting it out like a gun because there was no confined pressure like it coming out of a gun barrel. But nevertheless, that would have been quite a dangerous situation. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to uh, um, for, uh, save anybody's life there. So, there's an introduction to the history and heritage of Wellow for you. I think I've got any points or questions.